When I was younger, I traveled to many a different country, saw a lot of different things, met a lot of interesting people. Rarely did I see anything that I couldn't explain, though. And, well, as for Russia, the only time I spent there was a few too many hours stuck in Moscow airport in the mid-1990s. Not a pleasant experience, but nothing compared to what happened to the protagonists in tonight's story. Another fantastic tale from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me so I could read them all to you. Now, in a country as big as Russia, you're bound to see things that are beyond the ordinary. Time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink, my dear friends, and listen. My father's second cousin, Sasha Drozdov was apparently killed over some secret hunting routes he refused to reveal to some local businessmen. You see, Uncle Sasha, that's how I'm going to refer to him throughout this story, that's how I've always come to call him in real life anyway, well, he knew all the best hunting spots around Lake Jack London, in the Russian Kalima region. He was a chemistry teacher at a local school, as his official job, but he was also a part-time farmer and a licensed hunter. He was an all-round good man. Nobody had any problems with him. His family loved him. His students looked up to him. If only he hadn't come across this bastard. You see, due to corruption and its size, well, the law doesn't really reach everywhere in good old Mother Russia, so basically... These things still happen in Russia. No one had really known what had happened to Uncle Sasha after his dog came back home alone one afternoon from the woods, especially because he called his wife shortly before the dog arrived, informing her that he was pretty close by that point. My name is Simeon, and this is the story in which I'll tell you about how I found out that my uncle was murdered over something so trivial as a hunting route. It's also worth noting that I'm probably never going back to Russia at this point. I just can't. I was born and raised in a small village not far from Lake Jack, London, in the Magadan Oblast of Russia. It wasn't like most Russian villages, mostly because it was rather new, and it was... Somewhat a secret, you see. I come from a community of polytheistic Russians, a community that was started in the late 80s, when my parents were in their 20s. They were a young couple, in love, and the romanticism of this whole pagan thing attracted them. This community is unique, even amongst other such communities and movements. We do not follow some reconstructed religious rhetoric. We practice ancestral worship, a form of animism, which is basically nature spirit worshipping, and, of course, we worship our old gods. Now, that might sound like neo-pagan groups mostly, but the elders in our village actually have a deep disdain towards Rodnovery, which is a rather large neo-pagan movement among Russians, and Slavs in general. There are various other movements that could be summed up as heathenry, but to be completely honest, I find the latter to be quite stupid. I mean, how could a Russian person believe his folk had worshipped Norse gods like Odin by the masses? Even more so, the standard life in my home village includes abstaining from needless use of modern technology. That means we had electricity and hot water, but we didn't get TVs and fancy cars or whatnot. It wasn't bad, and it's not like we avoid modern commodities. We just try to live off nature as much as possible in a symbiotic harmony of sorts. Here's one thing I definitely took from my community that will most likely stay with me forever. I'm not going to get married. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like I'm abstaining from romantic relationships and whatnot, but that's not the case. We simply don't facilitate the relationship. I'm 23 now, and I've been dating my girlfriend, Veronica, since I was 14. Well, now that I've given you some context in regards to my story, 
I should be telling you what exactly happened to Veronica and I last summer when we visited the village. You see, we kind of hastily left seven years ago, and I'd forgotten for the longest time the reason that just made me snap, kidnap her, and set off to eventually reach my current home, Nelson, New Zealand. Now I remember, and I won't ever forget. You see, after so many years of barely any contact with our parents, we've decided to visit the old motherland. Last summer we informed our relatives our hour, impending arrival, and they seemed happy upon receiving the news. <laughs> it's kind of funny, but if it weren't for my old-fashioned parents, I would have forgot people still use letters. Anyway, I digress. Last summer, after a horribly long fright from NZ to Russia, we eventually made it home. To be honest, it also took a few days on a train and travel by car to actually reach the village. When we arrived that morning, everything seemed just as it had when we left. It's like nothing had changed in the last seven years. It was so surreal, almost like I was in an alternate universe. It well, unnerved me slightly. My family's reaction unnerved me even more. They acted as if I'd never left. It was really unpleasant watching my own parents act as if I hadn't randomly left their midst as a 16-year-old kid. What kind of parents would do that? I mean, I get it, we were a free society, and freedom was really encouraged. But they never came looking for me. Not even after they found out we were staying with my grandparents in Novosibirsk. It was borderline fucked up how they acted when we came back. Sure, everyone was happy and all, but if my kids had run away on me like I did on them, <laughs> I'd kick their asses when I'd meet them, and then, <laughs> and only then, shower them with love. Something was clearly off with my family. I mean, that was the most loving family ever when I was a kid. Veronica seemed to be suffering the same treatment from her parents, which distressed her quite a bit. I didn't like that. No, not at all. I would have made a fuss out of it, were it not for the fact my younger sister, Daria, had virtually almost knocked me off my feet when she jumped on me with a big bear hug. <laughs> the last time I'd seen her, she was a kid, but then, when he came back, she was a woman in body and mind. She hugged me tightly and started telling me of everything that had been happening ever since I'd left, including the fact that she'd been with the newly coronated Volk of our community. That made her a priestess, which she was quite boastful of. I felt proud of my younger sister. Well, I honestly did. Also, apparently, my parents had another son after I left. About two years after my departure, he was born, and they named him... Timofe. He kind of reminded me of myself as a child. Oh, it's such a shame I won't be able to be there for him. Or Dasha. I really wish I could have stayed. But after what happened, I cannot. It's not like I hate any of them. Really, I love my family, my childhood friends, and even my childhood neighbors. Man, I just cannot let go of what happened there. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> Sorry. This is kind of hard to write down. So, anyway, Vera and I settled down in a small shack that had been emptied especially for us, and the week we'd spent there was pretty much the perfect vacation. It was like we were in our own piece of heaven. I got to spend time with my family and the love of my life together. The rural scenery really fits my girl. She seemed so radiant back there. Not to say that she isn't now, but something over there made her seem even more special. We would go fishing together in the lake with my father and younger brother. Whatever was caught was splendidly cooked by the three most important women of my life. 
Vera and I even spent one night sleeping on a boat at the lake. It really was a nice experience. On the seventh day of our visit to the old village, it happened to be last year's Kupala night. It's basically a summer solstice festival we and many other pagans celebrate. Also, it had made its way into the folk life of Slavic Christians as a holiday. The whole idea of this holiday is to welcome Jarilo, the god of fertility, into the world once more, and pray for his blessings in agriculture and family life. In our case, it was a day-long festival at a local grove, filled with traditional music, dancing, a lot of drinking, and a sacrificial feast for the young god. A long table was stationed in the centre of the grove, at the middle of which sat a hay figure that was meant to represent the young god. It was just a large hay humanoid figure with a huge shaft, which, upon seeing, Vera joked how even a god cannot hold a candle to my pelvic prowess. <laughs> well, in front of said table, there was a set of kettles in which the sacrifices were boiled over a long pyre. That morning, each of the wishing would approach the Volk and his Volkvina and ask them for a blessing, sharing the troubles and desires and giving them their offering for Jarilo. Some offered birds, others offered bread loaves and portions of their harvest. After the initial gathering and requests, the offerings were made and by noon we'd had a celebratory feast with lots of food and alcohol. After the feast, we started participating in various fertility rites. Couples would have to hold hands and jump over a small pyre, and if they couldn't make the jump, it was a sign they weren't meant to last. Of course, Vera and I made the jump, rather easily, I must add. It was a day filled with joy and celebration. One of the more fun holidays I got to enjoy in my whole life. So, after some drinking, dancing and eating, I decided it was a good idea to invite my significant other to a date by the lake. So, it was me, her, a few candles and a bottle of vodka on that boat. Fortunately, we'd made it safe back to shore hours later, not even wasted. I guess I tend to get more intoxicated by her amazing presence than by alcohol, which is a good thing. We'd come back ashore when it was already dark. From the lake, the grove seemed completely dark and empty at this point in the day. It almost felt like you could feel the presence of various forest spirits in the area. Everything was covered in a blanket of darkness, everything aside from the sacrificial pyre that was still burning strong all these hours later. We came back to the grove and were seated down along with the majority of the village's population near a huge willow tree. We were also told that this was where a special occurrence was about to happen, something truly magnificent that does not happen every year. I became somewhat anxious. Perhaps it was the alcohol, or maybe the environment. It was, however, probably the attire Dasha was wearing. She had this long white dress and she covered herself in some kind of large pelt. Her face was covered in some sort of makeup. It looked almost like war paint, highlighting her already large green eyes. She looked almost menacing to me like that, especially because she was sitting on a horse. She raised a ceremonial toast for those in attendance, and we all drank with her. And then... She called out to someone. Four men came out from the woods, dressed in war paint and bear pelts. One of them was my friend, Lazar. I didn't catch the faces of the rest. I guess I was really drunk at that point, as seeing them drag a fat man along with them did not steer that much thought at first. Then I noticed that all of them were carrying wooden clubs. The memories came back. I remembered at that moment why Vera and I had left. I will never forget that again. Back when I was 16, there was this young woman in my village. 
She was a few years older than me, a real beauty. She was also apparently very intelligent and caring, as she made her way into a medical school in Magadha. So, just before we left, she came to visit her family with her boyfriend of the time. I remember being outside with a bunch of friends when we heard people screaming and cursing. We ran over to see what the noise was, and then we saw a bunch of the adults beating down on some poor chap. There was a whole mob beating down on this guy. The girl, well, her mother was holding her down as she begged them to stop, but they did not. They stopped only when he stopped moving. Completely. They'd beaten him to death over the fact that he was a Jewish man. I had no idea what that all meant, really, at that moment, and even gathered the courage to look at the corpse up close, being the stupid teenager that I was. He lay there on his back, his arms and face blistered and covered in cuts and bruises. His face was broken and bloodied. I recalled one of the boys even picking up a tooth from the poor man. Jeez. Oh. We poked at his body for a bit, before being chased away from the corpse by the elderly people of the village. I hadn't thought much of it back then. Now I do. God, it's fucking horrible. The next day, I remember going out early in the morning to see Vera as I was walking through the tiny streets of the village at some point. When I was nearing that young woman's house, I remember seeing an odd shape dangling from the roof. I slowly approached the house, and then I saw it. A sudden sense of dread overcame me. So sudden, I felt my breakfast come back up. She was suspended in the air, by a rope tied around her neck. That lifeless stare she had in her eyes. God, it's like... It's like she was staring right through me. A tug on my arm awoke me from my trip down memory lane. Vera was clutching at me as I was starting to realize what was happening. Dasha was standing next to the tied-up fat man. Her face. Oh, she had that same empty, lifeless stare in her eyes. She was staring right through him. He seemed mortified by the situation that he found himself in. The sight had sobered me up a lot. I knew I couldn't do anything about what I thought was going to happen, and I knew I wouldn't be able to leave. This was a very sacred religious ceremony on top of everything else. I knew what was coming, and I did not like it. No, not one bit. All I could do was wrap myself around Vera, try to comfort her. As, well, she was thrilled about what we were about to witness at that moment. Dasha began accusing the fat man of various crimes, such as greed, disrespect to the land, desecration of sacred grounds, and the murder of my uncle. Once I heard that, well, something inside of me snapped. I wanted to get to him and end his life, especially because he admitted to the deed. The crowd around me roared in disdain towards this man. Dasha then proclaimed him ripe for the right and stepped back from him. What came next was the most painful thing that I ever got to witness in my entire life. It probably will never be surpassed. The four men in pelts began beating on him with their clubs, making animal-like sounds while they were at it, as the crowd cheered them on. Each blow made a thumping sound that made me sick to my stomach. I felt myself almost shudder with each blow the pelted man landed, especially the ones that produced a crunching sound. The fat man was just lying there, begging and whimpering in agony as he was being broken down piece by piece by a bunch of Nuri depictors. 
The beating took a few minutes, and then it stopped. With a wave of her hand, my younger sister forced the four-pelted man to stop, and demanded him to be tied to the willow and her horse. I knew where this was going to go. It's been a common practice in ancient Russia to use horses as a means to rip apart criminals as a capital punishment. I knew this wasn't going to be any different. Yet, I knew I had nothing to do but watch the horrors that were about to unfold. My sister then began chanting, Oh gods, please welcome my gift, the blood of a sacrificial lamb. O oh, mighty Perun, please accept my offering, and Mother Mokosh, take it in. Father of Winds, Striborg, please accept it. The child of growth, Jarilo, embrace it. Svarog and Dazbog, consume it in flames. Ziva and Zara, take it up to the heavens to feast upon. Morena, Hold it in your cold embrace. Veles, mighty magician king, accept this misguided soul into your realm. The crowd repeated after her, and she kept repeating those lines over and over as the fat man was being tied to the tree. A piece of rope was fastened around his neck, and then the rope was tied to the horse. Dasha stopped chanting, and then signalled her horse to start walking, pulling the rope tighter and tighter. She began chanting again, O oh gods, please welcome my gift. My blood is of a sacrificial lamb. O oh mighty Perun, please accept my offering, and Mother Makosh, take me in. Father of winds, Streborg, Please accept it. The child of growth, Jarilo, embrace it. Svarog and Dazbog, consume me in flames. Ziva and Zara, take my soul up to the heavens to feast upon. Morena, hold it in your cold embrace. Veles, mighty magician king, accept my misguided soul into your realm. He had no choice but to follow her lead, struggling more and more with each sentence. As the rope tightened around his neck, his face went blood red and his eyes and teeth began bulging out disgustingly. Just as the man finished chanting, Dasha stopped the horse and the man gasped for air. And then I saw my sister smile. She smiled the most sinister smile. Everything went quiet, and I had to look away. She yelled at her horse to go. Lo, and behold, the fat man's head popped out of his place and fell onto the ground as the crowd around me burst out into drunken cheers. That sight, the sight of my sister doing something so evil, I just couldn't bear it. I whispered in Vera's ear that we were getting out of there as quickly as possible. She was clearly shaken up by the event we'd just witnessed. As we were making our way through the crowd, after a few minutes of unpleasant small talk with the people who were cheering for the death of the man, I noticed something at the edge of my vision. It was a tall figure, with horns. It was standing at the edge of the forest line, once I noticed it, the figure turned around and left. God, I must have been very drunk at that point. Yeah, now, you might be thinking, I'm probably going to conclude this story with some paragraph about how I've lost my faith and become an atheist or something. Well, that couldn't be further from the truth. You see, that night Vera and I had decided that we should spend the night in the lake again away from the bloodthirsty drunken mob. We thought that the fog that was covering the lake by this point would prevent the highly superstitious crowd from trying a night swim in that body of water. Hell, we were right. 
nobody came to the lake to follow or even look for us. Well, nobody human, that is. You see, while I was rowing the boat, with everything we'd been through that day, we couldn't even speak to each other, so we just sat there and stared. That's when a splashing sound could be heard near to us. It was impossible. There are no large animals in Lake Jack London, and it was way too deep in the lake for someone to be swimming there. Suddenly, a bright light came from inside the lake, encompassing an area far larger than that of the boat we were in. Vera, startled, grabbed at me, and we began panicking. I had no idea what to do or to think, honestly, so, well, I reached out to the water. It felt completely normal. Then, out of the blue, from that fog came the same figure I'd seen earlier. It was a tall humanoid with long hair and beard, sporting a robe-like garb, and it had huge antlers on the top of his head. It didn't look at us, or at anything really. It was simply walking into that light beneath us. We both simply gasped in awe at the sight. I wish I could say it was just my mind playing tricks on me, but there's no way. Both Vera and I saw the same thing. The figure then noticed us, turned its head towards us and stopped. Snake-like eyes stared at us for a few moments as we sat there, frozen in a mixture of fear and awe. And then, this thing, its neck expanded towards us. The beast exposed its sharp canines, showing us a bear trap-like set of teeth flying our way. Its head flew right by us, throwing us both out of the boat, before disappearing into the light, which then faded away with it. The sensation of cold water on my skin and the sounds of my screaming girlfriend shook me out of my trance. I quickly swam towards her, and began helping her back up onto the vessel. Nothing had happened to us as a result of our fall, but we were both dumbfounded by this strange occurrence, and Vera, well, she didn't let go of me for the rest of the night due to being so fearful that something else might happen to her. I don't know what the hell happened there. I don't know what we've seen. All I know is that my home village is filled with monsters wearing a human guise, and that I'm not contacting my family ever again. Also, I could swear that after the fall into the lake, I could hear a distant, satisfied laughter coming from below me. You see, on top of being the god of the underworld, the travelers, cattle and music, Veles is also a magician-like trickster god. So maybe, possibly, just perhaps, we encountered this god. Who's to say what really happened there that night? All that I can say is that, in a vast country like my motherland, where so many things are still unexplained and unexplored, everything is possible. Yes, as strange as it may sound, I guess in a country this big, you're bound to see things that are beyond the ordinary. So, I mean, yes, these things still happen in Russia. As for us, well, we're back in New Zealand, and we're not going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> I'm kind of into gardening right now. I've planted a willow in our garden, in honour of my horned god. Wow, what a crazy fantastic story that was. Hmm, what do you think of that? Well, Russia's a big place, lots of it is still unexplored, 
Strange things surely are going on. Anything that strange, though? I don't know. Well, fantastic story there. Thank you once again for joining me. And of course, I will be back with you again in just a couple of days from now. You're going to join me again, aren't you? Yes, you are. Of course you are. Well, until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it, if you like, on SoundCloud. Drop by the store. Pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay?